Bob Iger is president and CEO of Disney. We are delighted you are here. We're going to talk about risk and management, and you were quoted as saying, the riskiest thing we can do is just maintain the status quo. So you're our perfect guest. So we're talking about risk and failure. Why do you think leaders fail? Well, I think leaders fail for a number of reasons. Uh, arrogance is a sure way to create failure. Uh, sometimes in leadership positions, in positions of power, particularly when success ensues, it's easy for people to allow success to go to their heads and to get arrogant. Sometimes they fail because leadership can be an isolating experience. And in isolation, you lose the ability, for whatever reason, uh, to hear differing opinions. Sometimes with leadership comes a power that intimidates people to even express themselves in honest ways. And I think the last thing with leaders, which probably is a collection of all the things I just said, is it can go to your head. The old power corrupts, I think, is an apt, uh, truly apt statement or concept. How do you tell? You have so many companies that you manage and run and the chief executive officer, but you have other people that are presidents and other leaders all through your organization. How do you tell someone has the leadership spark? Is there something you particularly you look for? I think, yes, it is, but I think it's something you, you learn about someone over time. You, know, you can make decisions on people pretty quickly in terms of whether they're someone you want to hire or not. Right. But in terms of whether they have absolute leadership capabilities, the only thing you really know immediately is whether they look the part, whatever <laughs> that means. Right. And people have different definitions of, right. of what that means. But I think you need time to really see someone and get to know them better to determine whether they're a leader. See them in action, see them interacting with people, listening to whether they're open-minded, how passionate they are, you know, whether they uh, have the ability to take risks, to uh, the, the, the quote you, you threw back at me earlier. I think there are a lot of things you have to see before you can actually stamp leader on a person's forehead. So I'm sure you've had a couple of failures in your life, in your business life. How do you maintain your credibility as a leader and, and redirect once that's happened? Well, a lot of it depends on the degree of failure, and a lot of it depends on the root, the root of failure. I'm uh, fond of reminding people at our company that honest mistakes deserve second chances, that in effect it's okay to fail, it's okay to make a mistake. If it's the result of an honest error or trying hard, um, working hard to uh, fulfill a, um, a dream or to fulfill an instinct and learning over time that it doesn't work, it doesn't necessarily mean a career is over or a reputation is killed. When a reputation is killed is when failure comes as a result of loss of integrity, thorough lapse of judgment, breaking of rules, standards, laws, for instance. So there's it's very black and white for me in that regard. One type of failure doesn't deserve a second chance. In terms of failing in, you know, for legitimate reasons or uh, for business, uh, obviously there are degrees. Uh, abject failure on a sustained basis is obviously something that, unfortunately, the environment doesn't allow us to tolerate. Um, initial failure, whether it's mine or someone else's, you know, for reasons that um, you know, could be varied, but don't necessarily are not necessarily rooted in um, what I'll call tremendous personal error. I think it's important to give to give people an opportunity to learn from that, and to give them a chance to try again in some other form. Now, I, to the point that Peter made earlier with a quote, I, I'm a big believer in in taking chances and particularly in businesses that we're in, they're very dynamic, they're changing right before our eyes, a lot led by or caused by digital technology. And predicting the future or predicting the, the business environment is not as easy as it once was. And that's obviously going to take some risk because predictability is an issue and it will result in some failure. And again, I think we have, we have to have the ability to tolerate that and we must exhort people, particularly our leaders, to take risks. You know, I talk often about incumbents versus insurgents. 
big, large companies like Disney have been around a long time, even some of our divisions, ESPN, ABC, Pixar, Marvel, they're incumbents in many ways. We're competing with insurgents. Insurgents are great at taking risks because they approach everything with an everything to gain, nothing to lose mentality. And it's important for us to understand that as incumbents, if you take a everything to lose, nothing to gain, or little to gain mentality, then you're not going to try anything. And so if you, if, you, um, if you preach that philosophy and you preach the fact that you may not be an insurgent, but you have to act a little bit more like them, then you have to be willing to tolerate mistake. It's just, it's, it's inevitable. Can a leader succeed without really taking risks? Can he really or she really succeed without being, or being risk averse? No. Right. I think if you completely play it safe, you might get by for a while, right. but eventually that will catch up with you. Mm -hmm. And when you look at some of the content businesses you're in, movies and television, built into all the years new programming of television, built into all the new movies. Nobody can go by the strategy of just make hits. You're going to have everything don't work. And in, you know, in, creation, in creativity, everything is a risk. Right. It's not a science. Right. I tell that to people all the time. I try to explain that to shareholders and to board members right. as well. Um, you're constantly taking chances. You're constantly taking risks. And you're bound to experience failure. Actually, one of the, uh, I think, the the critical characteristics or attributes of a leader of a creative business is the ability to tolerate failure mm -hmm. because it's inevitable. It's right. bound to happen. There's no such thing as perfection, at least over a long period of time, in creativity. Pixar has come close, right. but, but there aren't many examples of that. We, we've talked about really risk-taking on ideas, but there's also a risk-taking about people. Mm -hmm. How do you factor the risks versus the rewards with people? Well, that's interesting, too, because I've, I've, I've been vocal with my team about this. We tend to take more risks uh, in business or with business decisions than we do with people. We're far more risk averse with people. And that stems from a number of things. We, t we, we tend to want to be in business with or have people working for us that we're comfortable with, that we know. We bet, and sometimes we um, overemphasize experience over vision, over ability to take risks, over sometimes intelligence. Experience becomes the um, almost the constant when it comes to people. That's not always right. Sometimes you can find people that are far more talented and less experienced. Over time, they'll gain the experience they need to succeed in the space, but the talent that they brought to whatever the pursuit or whatever the endeavor can be really valuable and can result in phenomenal success. But we're averse when it comes to taking risks on people without experience. Again, you lead by example. I'm fortunate to have been the, the product of a couple of bosses who took real chances with me, who put me in jobs that I had no experience in whatsoever. They took big risks. Now, they might have been a little nuts, but fortunately, they paid off. And that taught me a great lesson, and I've tried to do that with people as well. I just flipped the CFO of the Walt Disney Company with the head of our parks and resorts as an example. And while they were both considerable in terms of their talents and their intellect, their experience in each one's area was very limited. That was somewhat of a risk. They've done extremely well in their new positions. I think they were kind of cautious at first about what I was offering them to some extent because they were risk averse themselves about their careers. But the signal that it sent to the rest of the company that it's okay to take risks with people, put someone in a job that may not have experience but you really believe in them, has resonated well. We need to do more of that as a, as a company. I have one, for me, one last question. I have, was absolutely marveled at the, I shouldn't use the word marveled, I marveled at the experience of you taking over the company and making a very bold move in the very beginning with Pixar. It was a very bold move because it brought, in some sense, a fox into the chicken coop. You had Disney, it was a major animation company, world-class you know, brand, and suddenly there was Pixar there, and you made that move. How did you tell that story to your people who had such a vested interest in the market they had created? Well, how I told that story to the board is kind of more important. <laughs> okay. um, we had an issue with Disney Animation uh, a business that is about as core as any business is to the Walt Disney Company. Animation, since Walt Disney's day, has 
been a great wave maker, as I've said. It, it, the wave of great animation of the company has a ripple effect over all of our businesses all over the world over long periods of time. And we had experienced quite a long period of time in animation where, where we had little success. And I felt it was imperative for me as a new CEO to address that immediately. If I had a priority, I had a few priorities, but that was at the top of the list. And as I looked at the alternatives, the one that seemed the most obvious to me was an acquisition of Pixar. However, they were not for sale. Uh, they would be expensive if they were for sale. And I knew that it would be, I never looked at it as bringing a fox into the hen house. We had a long relationship with them, but I knew that it would shake things up big time. All things, by the way, that I was perfectly willing to do, particularly given the fact that I had a strategic hole or creative hole that had to be filled quickly. And so I set about to examine whether it was possible and to fully analyze all of the issues related to it on the positive and the negative sign, side and ultimately felt that if we could get this done and it was not an easy task, it would be fantastic for this company long term, even if it bore a fair amount of risk, which it did. And fear amongst some of the people who were there in that category. Well, there were people at Disney Animation whose jobs were definitely on the line when we made the acquisition, and the f their fear was not something I was as worried about. The animators in general embraced it because we brought into the company animation leadership that was about as respected as you could get in the right. business. John Lasseter right. on the creative side, Ed Catmull on the right. technology side. And it was hard for them to do anything other than embrace that. Right. It was exciting for them. Right. And it was a shot in the arm for Disney Animation to have those leaders as partners and as collab or as collaborators in their animation pursuits. So that really was, that, that didn't become or was not at any time the big issue for me. The big issue was the size of the acquisition and convincing ourselves and then, and then the board that it was a risk, a risk worth taking, right. that there would be value there. Of course, one of the biggest questions was how long could their success continue? Right. And would an acquisition uh, destroy the very essence of what Pixar was and essentially obliterate their ability to continue that great success? And, and fortunately, I think we've proven that 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 has not been the case. Certainly. What, what's your role as the C, as CEO in, in prompting risk taking? Is it that you're the idea person, you're the person who seeds the strategic talent that comes to you? How do you create that culture as leader? Well, first of all, running a company like this takes a lot of people, a lot of very talented people. It's not one person. But I know that my role as a CEO and as a leader obviously demands that I, I set direction and that I set standards and that I act as a, a catalyst. So the way, the way I look at it, my job is to inspire people. My job is to be a catalyst, whether it's a catalyst for risk taking, a catalyst for change, a catalyst for greater quality or experimentation. And then I am conscious in many ways of the company. We don't have a chief ethics officer. I consider that one of my primary responsibilities. Um, and that's, that, that's what I try to portray in sort of my everyday life throughout the, throughout the many places that our company does business. Uh, with that comes you know, the, the need and the ability to uh, inspire people to take risks, to inspire people to act as insurgently as they possibly can, uh, to you know, be decisive, take chances, to value people. To, there's a variety of different things that obviously It has to be considered, it has to be performed in a, in a job like this. Great. So thank you so much Thanks. for coming to UCLA Anderson. Pleasure. Thank you.